Okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about, um, you may, how many people here today were here yesterday for my other talk? Okay, and no kids are here yet, are they? No. Okay, good. Um, sorry, I, I, I keep seeing people grab these don't click on shit stickers and you know my opinion on them. So anyway, instead of just holding up the stickers, um, Okay, so again, Niatron paid me to be here. Niatron's a good company. I've done my job. Um, okay, so let's talk about this presentation. This presentation is a little bit more uh, practical on specifically how. I think the problem is those mics are still on. Yeah, I just filled out a lot. Okay. Um, now I got to out talk John. That's it. Yeah. But. Oh, uh, well, I'll, just as I start talking, I can hear how bad it is. Um, did you just want me to use a handheld and unplug everything? Well, it's up to you, but... Yeah, uh, it's just a... This is, like, super sensitive. Let's try this one. How's that? Uh, I'll just go with this. Um, okay, so let's talk about, um, so creating a human security officer. This essentially is a little bit, like I created this presentation before I created the other one yesterday. This is more of a lower level type of issue on how to implement what I spoke about yesterday, again, at a lower level type of thing. Now, let me tell a story. So, hopefully none of you heard this story or else it gets boring, but, so, one time I was doing a penetration test, like physical espionage simulation, where I was working with an accomplice to infiltrate a Fortune 500 company. And we were in the middle of nowhere, because this is a nice Fortune 500 company in the middle of nowhere, and they make power generation systems. And what happened was, we were supposed to just see what we could do in a week. And I took my accomplice with me, I go, here's the deal, we're gonna go into the corporate headquarters, and they're going to have a big entranceway, which is probably about the size of this room. And the door is, let's say, where the screen is. And then they have the reception desk pretty much where that table in the middle is. And then there's a door over there, ironically, right where that door is, where most employees would go to. And they go, like, from here, diagonally to the left, and go in there. And there's another door there, and you know, behind the desk. So anyway, I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk in. And we're going to just basically act like we're talking, and we're going to go straight to the door on the left. And we're just going to ignore the receptionist if she tries talking to us. And then we're going to go up an elevator, so we do that, we go up there. We go up an elevator, the elevator requires a swipe, and, but everybody, it's morning rush hour, everybody's swiping, pretty much every button was pushed. So we end up going on the second floor, and I said, we're just going to try to find an empty conference room. So we get the empty conference room, and what happened was, we sit there, then I pick up my telephone, I pick up the phone in the conference room, I go, hi, um, I'm the CIO and I need some contractors to get badges, where do I send them? I got transferred around a couple times, finally somebody picks up and says, send them down to the front desk. So anyway, we go down, me and my accomplice go down to the front desk, nice woman there, and she's like, I saw you two go by and I tried to stop you. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, we were talking. She's like, oh, you look busy, don't worry about it. I'm like, thanks. Anyway, and then so finally, the woman says, okay, you need badges. And I go, yes, we do. So she gets on the phone, calls somebody up, and a guard comes over, and they, she tells the guard, these gentlemen need badges, and the guard's like, okay. And the guard takes us to a room, ironically, where that door would approximately be. And we go in the guard room, and we're getting our pictures taken, and then we're sitting there. And then the guard goes, oh, as we're, you know, we get the pictures, it's an HID card, you know, one of those swipe cards. And the guard goes, so what do you two do? I go, oh, we do computer stuff. She's like, oh, do you need access to the server room? I go, as a matter of fact, we do. So anyway, she's like, well, I'll add that to the server room access. I'll give you server room access. You know, it might take a couple hours, but pretty, you know, but it'll be there by lunchtime. I'm like, okay, we can wait. So anyway, we go ahead, we wait around till lunchtime, which is, you know, usually a good time because we try to infiltrate an area when nobody's going to be there and lunch is as good a time as any. 
So anyway, we go to the lunch, you know, lunch hour, we just walk around the basement, swiping the card to see which door opens up. And then finally we find a door that opens up, we look in there, and then there's a whole bunch of systems turned on. One was apparently the Windows primary domain controller. We had a new admin user to the system, and then we rename it to something innocuous. So pretty much then we had pretty control over the company's entire network, and that was kind of fun and easy and took two days. So, or it's, I'm sorry, two hours. So then what happened was, you know, finished the test, which is fairly, you know, and that was just a sampling of, you know, something, but obviously important. So then what happens is we get a call. I, I'm like walking around like I'm home and everything, and I get a call about three weeks later. It's like, I'm the physical security manager, and I need to know the name of the guard who gave you the badge. I'm like, excuse me? It's like, well, I'm the manager of the physical security manager. I run these buildings. I need to know which guard gave you the badge. I go, there's a couple problems with what you're saying right now. It's like, well, I need the name. I go, I'm not giving you the name. I, he's like, you have to give me the name. I run the facility. So I go, here's the problem. I don't have a clue. And, you know, I go, I'm from New York. I don't give, oh, sorry, no kids here. Okay, I go, sorry, the guy was getting on my nerves. I don't give an F about who you really are. I go, the only person I report to is the CIO. If the CIO calls me up and I confirm his identity, I will, and he asks me for it, I will give him the name of the guard. I go, however, you should be warned that if, when I give him the name of the guard, if asked, I will also let him know that the fact this guard gave me the badge is bad. The fact you don't know who that guard is is infinitely worse. Because think about it this way. You know, everybody thinks the guard's kind of an idiot, right? The problem is not the guard, because I didn't give the guard, you know, I, don't, I didn't even write it. The reason I, do, you know, I don't usually put names in there unless there's something clearly wrong. In my opinion, the guard did nothing wrong. And the reason is, what is the process for that company to give out badge and sensitive access? I have no clue. But apparently, in practice, the process was, you talk to the nice receptionist, if the nice receptionist says they get a badge, they get a badge. If they want extra access, they just ask the guard for the access and that's all you need. There was no authorization process for restricted areas. There was no authorization process for badges beyond convincing the, the receptionist you're a nice person. That was all that was required. And everybody who thinks the guard is an idiot is the idiot themselves. Because you have to stop and think, and again, this whole, you know, don't click on shit stickers that's going around out there. The problem is not that people click on shit, the problem is you're giving people shit to click. That's the problem. You can't blame people for clicking on stuff that's sitting in their corporate inboxes. You have allowed that to get there. That's the fundamental issues. Likewise, the guard did nothing wrong because that's the process. They gave the guard the ability to add access to any room, frankly, in the entire Fortune 500 company. That's a significant problem. If I said I need access to the CEO's office, I could have got access to the CEO's office. Maybe she would say, oh, I might need to check on that, but literally, there's no process. There's no document anybody could point me to that said that guard violated any process or procedure. So anyway, coming along, is that fern annoying? I mean, we're, we're not like between two ferns. This is actually supposed to be a presentation. So anyway, um, the human, you know, generally, you know, going back to a little bit of the presentation yesterday with some overlap, everybody thinks the problem is the human is the weakest link. That no matter what happens, you could put a perfect security program together and inevitably a user can fail and your whole security program fails because that user failed and that clearly the solution for your whole security program is to just give that person better awareness. It's so obvious, right? And then of course people do that, they're like, we're going to give funnier videos because funnier videos they will might remember until the end of the day as opposed to until the end of the questions we ask or something like that. But it's like, we're going to have funny videos and that, and you know, so what happens? You know, there's a whole scientific concept of the forgetting curve, which means pretty much they forgot it by the time you said anything and nothing changes. And, but of course, it's the stupid user who's the problem. Anyway, the reality, successful attacks against users 
are a, an example of a systematic failing throughout your entire organization. Again, for a user to click on shit and ruin your network, that means that your network sucks. That's a given. That somehow you have let an obvious thing, a stupid user, you have allowed that stupid user enough access and enough permissions to ruin your network. That means you're the stupid one there. So again, remember, behind every stupid user is a stupider security professional, at least usually, usually, I should say. There are some users out there, I swear, if you send them a phishing message that says, if you click on this message, it will ruin the network, they will click on that message. About 3% of people will click on that message. But again, you've got to expect that no matter what. So anyway, and security teams, here's the problem. Security teams are, or actually let me cover that other part, which I kind of covered yesterday, but for those who weren't here, basically technology governance and awareness are treated as separate silos. So for example, with a phishing problem, you have one group of people like the technologists that say, well, we need to buy some mails filtering software, we're going to do that. Then you have some people who work in governance. It's like, well, we have to write policies and procedures. We'll write them, we finish them. Okay, now we submit them, put them on the shelves until the auditors show up once a year. And But we've done our job. And then you have another group of people working awareness and these awareness people are saying, oh, my job is to give people funny videos or something like that. So basically you have three different people all tackling what is essentially the same problem, working completely independently and not caring what the other people are doing, not trying to work together in any way, shape, or form. But then you have security teams, and like I spoke about yesterday, they're afraid to change the organization. You know, everybody's like, oh, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to blame anybody, we don't want to do anything, you know, oh, well, we, we don't want to have penalties because we can't blame the users or anything like that. We don't want to enforce anything. And it's like, you can blame the user. How many people heard the expression, you can't blame the user? If the user does something really stupid, you can blame the user. Because think about it this way, how many organizations, like how, did anybody, tr beside, anybody travel here or something like that? Okay, a couple people. If you ever travel for your organization, or actually, let's just do time cards. You all work for an organization. And most people have to confirm the hours that they worked, if you take days off, or something like that. Stop and consider what happens if you don't properly fill in the system for your time properly. Do you get paid? Does anybody say, hey, oh, we don't want to blame the user. We can't punish the user for not entering their time properly. No, you enter your time properly or you don't get paid. There's no question about that. That's a lot less fair in my mind than just having somebody, you know, telling somebody, well, you're kind of got to sit through extra training because you screwed up the entire network. I mean, somebody looks at pornography in their company, they get fired. Somebody goes ahead and ruins the network so nobody can look at pornography, they just get, oh, please don't do that again. That, that's not the right way to do things. But anyway, security teams are afraid, you know, they're treated like the bastard child and if that's your attitude, you deserve to be treated like the bastard child if you're not going to do anything effectively for the organization. Now, let me take a step back and say awareness isn't perfect. You know, even if you have perfect awareness, even if you get everybody to do everything, it's not going to hit everybody. Because here's the thing, people don't realize, when you do an awareness program, your goal should not be, I am going to make everybody really aware. You know, it's kind of like a risk, it's like all security countermeasures. Security countermeasures, again, how many people are security professionals or whatever? Okay, you're all failures. I mean, <laughs> definition of security is being free from risk. You're never free from risk. You're risk management people if you're doing your job right. You're balancing potential losses against the resources that you have. That's your job. And no matter what, awareness is not a perfect countermeasure. Oh, you know, and they're like, oh, well, awareness programs suck. It's like, how many encryption programs fail? And again, the only reason that people can demonstrate a failure of awareness is because all the other technology has failed and has presented the, the user with shit to click on, according to the stickers out here. So those are the issues. And again, I'm trying to find a place where I'm not echoing, but that's not working. So anyway, awareness isn't perfect. But here's the problem. Most awareness programs are not awareness programs. 
Most awareness programs are training programs, and it makes a big difference. If you've ever read, I'm probably the only person who ever read NIST 800-50, which actually defines security awareness programs, training, and things like that. The definition of training is providing people with a fixed body of knowledge, maybe testing them on it. The definition of awareness is changing behaviors. Your goal for awareness programs is to change behaviors. You know, compliance programs, maybe you have to show, did you give people the required training? It's not, did you give people the required awareness? It's, did you provide something you could show an auditor at the end of the year? That's what a training program is, and that's essentially what most people confuse an awareness program with. So when most people say, oh, well, we've got really funny videos, so that's going to solve the problem. It's like, no, you've got really funny videos that go in a learning management system so you could show the auditors at the end of the year, you show them videos that nobody actually cares about. So that's kind of the biggest problem. And phishing simulations, you know, there's some benefit. I talk to people who do phishing simulations. Some are better than others. I work with different organizations that have good ones. Different companies have better solutions or worse solutions. But the situation is that phishing simulations generally train people on detecting phishing simulations more than they detect on real phishing messages. Because the worst part is when I see a company highlight you know, after watching our training, I was afraid to open up my email. I'm like, oh, God, you should fire the company who sent that. And why? Because your job is to train people how to do their jobs safely and confidently. Your job isn't scaring people away from doing their job. Again, checking email is part of their job. Clicking on shit is part of their job. You've got to go ahead and train people how to do that aspect of their job properly generate the right behaviors. And most phishing simulations, some phishing simulations can be good, but most phishing simulations are just there to get people from a 20% click rate down to zero. And when you get people down to a 0% click rate, it means you're probably getting really superficial messages and you're not, you're not improving awareness in any level after that. Because if you're doing a good awareness program, a phishing simulation program, you should constantly up and increase the level of sophistication of your messages so that training and awareness increases as time goes on. Again, you don't send people to computer, you know, you don't get a computer science major and say, okay, we're going to keep giving you computer science 101 until you get 100% on your test. No. You give people computer science 101, maybe they get somewhere between 100 and a 70, or it was a so you get 170 ideally, 70 to 100, and then they take computer science 102, and then they get somewhere between the 70 and 100, and then they take computer science 201, or whatever, and you keep increasing their knowledge. You don't try to get everybody down up to 100 before, and then leave them there and the basic program. You keep upping the level of information as time goes on. That's what's critical. So now here's the other aspect. Even smart people make mistakes. I have... How many of you are Unix admins or at any point in time worked Unix? How many of you have accidentally hit rm star dot star dot star minus rm minus r star dot star dot star in the wrong directory? You know, you thought you were in one directory, it's like, oh, that was a mistake. And then you hope that somebody did backups at some point in the recent future? I've done that. I've accidentally clicked on things I shouldn't have clicked on. And why did I do that? Because sometimes the system was just running slow at a given point in time and the cursor wasn't, the, cur the computer thought the cursor was someplace different than where the cursor actually was, which happens on a frequent basis. There's a lot of things that happen. You're never going to get any user at any given time to be 100% perfect. You know, they can be mostly perfect. They can even know what the right thing is. There's another concept in psych well, psychology compliance called the compliance budget. What the compliance budget means is I might know exactly what I should be doing. I might really want to do it, but there might be something at a different point in time that has me do something differently. And let me give a good example, especially around my area, and I think it's pretty much the same everywhere else. Um, how many people put their kids in childcare at some point in time or another? Put your kids in childcare, and you have to pick your kid up at a given time. And the child care companies know they don't want the kids just sitting around thinking, well, you're just running late, no big deal. They fine you like $5 a minute or something like that. I don't know how many people have to deal with that, but in my area, 
there are people who are going to run other kids over just to make sure they get to the child care center by, you know, so they don't have to pay $5 a minute fine. And these people are like, you know what, I know I should lock up my desk at the end of the day. I know I should put all my stuff away. I know I should turn off my computer. But what happens, it's like right at a certain time, and they know if they don't get out, they're not gonna, they're gonna be fined $5 a minute. So screw whatever the process is for locking up their stuff. They're gonna get out because there's another competing issue. Likewise, you might want to do the same thing. You know, you might have other requirements, but you might have a work deadline. Not personal, but work deadline. And if you don't get something out at a given point in time, you're going to go ahead and do it. For example, how many people know they should do backups at a given point in time every week or whatever? And then how many people don't do those backups because there are other more seemingly pressing issues that come up? Why? Because backups, you really don't need them very frequently in all honesty. But then when you do need them, then you're screwed. But again, it's a little bit like crying wolf, and you know you should, but you don't. So anyway, um, some attacks are well-crafted, so I beat that to death. Okay, so now you have technical countermeasures. And again, like I've already mentioned, technical countermeasures aren't perfect, because again, if people have shit to click on, it meant you did not do your job, because you allowed the shit to get to their inbox. So anyway, those are failures. So let's talk about how you can potentially examine, like because yesterday I spoke about in the grand scheme of things, stepping through the process of ensuring that we analyze an attack, you know, and I just did it at a high level, that you have to figure out how an attack would get to the user, how a user reacts to the attack, and then how to respond to the attack if it's successful. So anyway, there's a whole concept of kill chain. And, you know, I'm not talking about the cyber kill chain because, you know, that really is just relevant for malware. I'm talking about military kill chain principles at a high level. With military kill chains, it basically is the acknowledgement that there are many phases of an attack. And every phase of an attack is a moving the attack forward. But likewise, it's a point in time or a point during the attack where you can first detect the attack and prevent the attack from moving forward. Ideally, you don't have to respond to a point in time of the attack, but it's basically stepping through, figuring out where you can detect it, prevent it, and so on. But again, each phase in the kill chain is the adversary's kill chain, but it's also an, an opportunity for you to kill the attack in progress. So a traditional kill chain generally are the phases of an attack, and this is more of a military type of com uh, terminology where you find a potential target, so for example, if we talk about, let's just say an aircraft carrier in the middle of an ocean. Now generally, aircraft carrier strike groups are pretty big, but the ocean's even bigger, so sometimes it's hard to find them if you don't have good signals intelligence or whatever. So you've got to go ahead and say, like, let's say Russia, I would say, let's say the U.S. wants to blow up a Russian aircraft carrier, but the way to do that is just let the aircraft carrier itself go for Russia. Um, but, you know, for us, if you want to blow up a U.S. aircraft carrier, somebody has to basically be able to first find the aircraft carrier. And then, so the first thing is, they, Russia has to say, okay, there's a carrier strike group somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, we don't like it, they're coming close to Petropavlovsk, to Vladivostok, whatever the case is, and we want to figure out where it is so we can blow it up before it gets within striking range of our bases in Petropavlovsk or whatever. So anyway, the phases of an attack, first you have to find where the carrier strike group is. And it's like, okay, I think I found it. Now you have to go ahead and you have to get a more specific, accurate fix on it. So we said, okay, it's within this area in the general ocean. Now we have a high level fix on where it is. So we're gonna start sending the bombers out and start figuring out how to go ahead and target that. Then we're gonna go ahead, now we got a more specific lock on it. So now we're gonna track it. And then at some point in time, we're tracking it and we're like, okay, now we develop a specific target. And then we've got to get the order to engage. In other words, we know exactly where the carrier is. Now we've got to go ahead and engage it. In other words, we fixate it and we're going to engage. In other words, shoot it. And then we've got to go ahead and assess the damage for it. So, for example, if you send a hypersonic missile at an aircraft carrier, did you hit the aircraft carrier? Is the aircraft carrier sunk? Or maybe is it still functional? Can it be towed or whatever? Do we need a secondary attack on it? So that at a high level is how a kill chain theoretically works at a general attack in progress. Now, 
traditional adversary activity. They got to identify the targets, and this is kind of where it's getting more relevant. Not for the cyber kill chain. The cyber kill chain, again, is really just a malware type of targeting thing. But, you know, generally when I say target identification at a high level, it's something along the lines of, I want to target, uh, let's stop talking, you know, military and intelligence. Let's just say, I want to steal money from Target. Like, I mean, that's already been done, so it makes an easy known thing. So anyway, I want to start identifying Target. How am I going to get into Target? You know, force dispatch. In other words, how can I get in? So I'm going to start probing Target, and then I realize, you know something? I think the vendor network is the easiest way to get into Target. So I'm going to start sending phishing messages out to the Target vendors. Now I have the phishing messages out to the vendors. I have established a foothold on the network. Now that I have a foothold on the network, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start the attack. In other words, for Target specifically, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to load malware on the Target Configuration Management System. So in other words, the Target Configuration Management System is what sent the malware automatically. They use Target's own resources to send malware to all the Target point of sale systems. So then they went ahead and sent the stuff out and destruction of Target in this case. Um, and include in that target, target, yeah. I just realized well, how ironic I just made the title of the company. But anyway, so it can include the capture of information. So in other words, you know, in this case, it was like, okay, we want to, on the point of sale systems, we want to steal the swipes so that we can get the uh, credit card numbers and all the information on the credit card. So that's what they did in that case destruction or infiltration of systems simultaneously, not only did they capture credit card swipes off the system, they compromised the target back-end systems like the target red card system. A lot, I'm not sure how many people know that Target is one of the largest credit card issuers in the world because they have the target red card, and I think there's 40 million target red card holders, so that gave the criminals lots of information that way. But that was another example of destruction. Now, here's the thing. Over time, the human has become the choice attack vector for people. Again, 90% of all attacks are targeting users, or sorry, humans in one way or another, as the primary attack vector. In other words, how am I going to get access to the targeted organization? And it became the vector of choice. And why is it the vector of choice? Is it because people are stupid? Kind of. But more importantly, not only are people let's just say, less reliable than a technology, your companies really suck at acknowledging and securing around that vulnerable piece. You know, if you knew, for example, that there was a mainframe computer and all mainframe computers were really kept very vulnerable, everybody would be targeting mainframe computers. If you knew, for example, all these companies use, uh, what's a good one? Uh, who, should I impugn, who should I impugn now? Um, you know, let's just say, for example, a lot of companies are using Cloudflare. And you know, Cloudflare is a vulnerable attack vector. Everybody's going to try to get Cloudflare accounts and stuff like that. So anyway, that's part of the issue. Again, it's the poor controls around the user that are the bigger issues than the users themselves. Because organizations generally don't protect users from doing user stuff. And that's the biggest problem. So again, they assume the organization, you know, they already assume it, and what they do is they determine who are the best people to target at a point in time. And LinkedIn and all these other social networks are really great these days of providing companies with or attackers with a shopping list of what they want to do. Then, in the case of uh, in the case of cyber attacks, you know what are the potential execute? You know what essentially what acts do the criminals potentially want to perpetrate? Like I said, list there, you maybe want to execute actions. In other words, perhaps you want to target a network at a foothold so you could use that network to target somebody else. Again, much in the same way that um, the criminal who targeted Target, um, they basically went ahead and targeted a vendor network, and the vendor was basically just a third party that had access to the intended target. So that was another issue. You might just want to collect information such as credit cards, and that's one issue. You might want to destroy information. Again, if you want to like these ransomware attacks and holding people hostage, is it a case of where people just want to destroy information 
and stuff like that. Implant listening devices such as spyware. There's a lot of cases where people plant spyware on people they don't like. They hack cell phones to turn cell phones into listening devices and so on. Anyway, each attack has its own kill chain. And what I mean by that is, you know, at a high level, um, an attack, you know, like an attack isn't this, I'm, I'm a human and I'm going to target a given company. What I mean by that is every type of attack, for example, that if you're going to like have a physical security attack, that has one kill chain. If you have a phishing attack, that's another one. If you do a USB drop, that's another type of kill chain and so on. Because if I'm going to like look at the kill chain for a USB drop, it's like, okay, I've got to look for where am I going to drop USB drives. And then I got to figure out, okay, where are people from the company likely going to be? Should I do the parking lot? You know, perhaps if I do a parking lot, that could, you know, if it's a shared facility, might not be the best thing. If I know, for example, the CEO is in a given area, maybe I'm going to go ahead, go to the CEO's home, and target and like drop a USB drive right by his car door or something like that to see if he finds it or something. That might be a more specific way, but that's a different type of kill chain than a phishing kill chain as an example. So here's the thing. Policies, procedures, guidelines have to be identified for each of these kill chains. In other words, or each of these types of attacks. And you've got to say, okay, USB, you're saying that USBs require their own policies and procedures? Yes. Phishing requires its own? Yes. You know, somebody tailgating inside an organization to get physical access? Yes, you need different policies and procedures for that as well. But technology also has to be implemented because here's one of the problems with human-based attacks. Too many people think that if I'm going to try to secure a user, I've got to focus on the user and figure that out. I want to use technology so that the user doesn't have a choice. For example, if you remove USB drives from computers, you eliminate the possibility that somebody's going to find a USB drive and stick it in a computer. I work with one company that took super glue and squirted it in every USB thing. And they said, if you need a USB access, if you need to plug a USB into any of your devices, we only have one computer and you have to bring it to the admins and the admins have to scan anything you're going to do. Because even, for example, picture frames. People have put malware on USB picture frames and stuff like that, so you have to be concerned about it. Anyway, let's talk specifically about phishing. Regarding phishing, because it's one of the easiest ways, because everybody thinks, okay, some idiot clicks on a phishing message, okay, kids started walking in, I'm just going to pretend, I'm just going to hold this up so now you know what I mean. Okay, everybody knows the code, right? Okay, so anyway, so everybody thinks, okay, users are clicking on stuff, and you got to sit there, how are the users clicking on stuff? How is it getting there? What's the reaction afterwards? You've got to start to go ahead and figure it out. Now, there are generally 10 phases of a phishing kill chain. Nine of those phases are completely within your control. In other words, where you are going to fail. So let's step through as an example. So, and here, before I start doing this, here's what I want to say. If you can detect, with a lot of these human-based attacks, if you can detect them in progress, and you stop it against one person, you can almost safely assume that if a, like if, a, if a criminal is targeting one person, they're likely targeting a dozen people or your whole organization simultaneously. But if one person says, hey, I found a USB drive sitting in the parking lot, at least the admins can stop and say, wait a second, this person found a USB drive, we better send out a warning and let everybody know that somebody dropped USB drives and we're going to tell everybody, hey, because these, those other people might not be aware. And you send out a warning and say, hey, if you found a USB drive in the parking lot, please bring them to us immediately. And by the way, if you plug them into your system, we need to know that as well. You know, because, you know, sometimes it's not obvious if a smart criminal's there, a smart criminal's not going to say, hey, you just plugged in a malicious USB drive. They're going to make it surreptitious what the damage is and things like that. So anyway, that's part of the issue. So anyway, think about if you detect, if somebody detects it later, you can go back and start killing it earlier in the kill chain for other users who did not click on it yet. So anyway, here's the, my obligatory pictures because I didn't have enough pictures, so I put pictures in. Um, anyway, so first place that you can start for a phishing kill chain are the, are the mail, or the, before the mail service. In other words, the internet as a whole is the first phase of a phishing attack. 
because the phishing messages has to, have to come from somewhere. The phishing messages, for example, have to come from a botnet at, at some point in time. So somewhere around the internet, somebody has compromised these systems. Now technically, you really can't do much about somebody who's compromised systems around the internet. You might join something like the anti-phishing working group and fi figure out which nodes to blacklist potentially. You might work with your ISPs to tell the ISPs if you know there are malicious nodes out there, please block them for me, and so on. Some companies have blocked tour links and things like that. So anyway, first phase of the kill chain is the internet itself, for lack of a better phrase. The second phase of a kill chain are your mail servers. In other words, the corporate mainframe mail servers, a lot of companies right now that's like Google, you know, Google Apps and stuff, but for the most part, your mail servers are the first phase of a phishing kill chain that are completely within your control. At that phase, what you should already have are you should have malware filters on the mail servers, you should have spam filters on the mail servers. You should pretty much filter out any potential apps sometimes and just say, hey, a lot of companies do filter out the apps or an apps in a sim, or sorry, filter out um, not apps, attachments like and things like that, malware, and they run them in a sandbox before they send them to a user so you, the user is not getting hit with these things. But that could all be done on the mail server. But let's say for some reason that the mail server has not filtered out the payload, it has not accurately filtered out phishing messages, and so on. The next place it goes to are the client mail applications. In other words, might be your Outlook servers. It might be your personal inboxes on Google Apps or whatever. And if you're looking at something like Outlook, Outlook has its own anti-spam filter, well, its own spam filters. It has its own anti-malware, like again, it has um, like Windows Defender, for example. You might have also purchased some other system, like you might be running McAfee or Symantec on your system, and those likewise create uh, you know, spam filters and malware filters and so on. So your anti, so your phishing, sorry, your email client should be filtering out lots of attacks before it's presented to the user. But anyway, Let's just say that doesn't happen. Now you have a user sitting there, and the user's sitting there and saying, hey, is this message a phishing message, or is this not a phishing message? And sometimes a user looks in their spam filters and opens up messages in their spam filters. How many people heard about the RSA hack, where China hacked into RSA to steal the secure ID software? Okay, they did that because what they wanted to do was China wanted access to defense contractors like Lockheed Martin and so on. And they knew that Lockheed Martin was using RSA Secure ID tokens, and in order to try to compromise it, they needed the source code for the RSA Secure ID. And so what they did was they wanted to steal the Secure ID. So what China did was they went ahead and they figured out that RSA uses Monster.com as a recruitment tool. And they figured out, okay, who is the person inside RSA that receives spreadsheets from Munster.com with potential applicants for jobs? And they sent that person an attachment that looked like it was from Munster.com, and it was an outdated spread, it was like a Windows, they were running an old version of Windows Excel that had, had a macro on, and they emailed it, sent this targeted message to that person. That actually went to that person's spam filter. And that person still pulled it out of their spam filter to open it up, which then gave China access. So anyway, that's something. But either way, the user has the ability to say, hey, maybe I want to open this, maybe I don't want to open it, in my spam filter or in my inbox. Then the mail application should say, hey, wait a second. That would be a really stupid thing to do. Are you sure you want to open up this message out of your spam filter? And there are applications that literally do this. You know, this isn't from the address you're saying it's from and so on. That's why it's in the spam filter. But somebody's going to say, you know what? Okay, the system has warned me, but I still want to open up that message. Why? Because I just do. Because that's what users do. So anyway, they open up stuff, but they can either delete it, they can report it, or they can go ahead and open it. If they don't delete it or report it and they open it, then the next thing that should happen is the client prevents the attack. The client should say, you know what? This message, this email wants to download a file. I'm not going to let it download. 
or this message wants to take you and they want you to give up credentials at an outside link, I'm not letting you go to that link. And that technology already exists. So anyway, that's what theoretically should happen. Data leak prevention should prevent a lot of you from sending out data and so, so on. But anyway, let's say the per you don't have that in place. The next place is the network should prevent the attack. In other words, you should have, for example, web content filters. The web content filters might, for example, say, hey, you know what? You want to go to this malicious link, I'm not letting you out to that malicious link. And they block the user from going to the malicious link. Or they want to bring a data file in, and it might say, hey, you're not allowed to bring data files in, or whatever the case is. So the web filters, the everything should stop that, you know, because you have proper attack measure or proper security measures in place. Anyway, let's say that doesn't work. Let's say the user gives up their credentials to a third party, and then that person tries to come in and log on as them. At some point in time, the network should say, hey, why are you logging in from Kazakhstan when you're simultaneously logged in in your office? Or why are you trying to come in at 3 a.m. as opposed to during normal work hours or something like that? This should happen. Or let's say it's a malware incident, like a WannaCry or something like that. It should be like, hey, why are you, individual system, trying to send out messages and infect the rest of the network? We're going to stop you and we're going to isolate you or something. But let's say that doesn't happen. At that point, the network should detect compromise, like you have online, um, sorry, well, user and user behavioral analytic, user entity and behavioral analytic types of tools that detect that malicious systems are malicious and acting against the systems in the network, and they should be stopped, detected, and mitigated. And pretty much those are the 10 phases of a phishing kill chain. When you stop and think, there are so many different phases. But in reality, only two of those phases involve the user doing anything. But everybody says, oh, a user clicked on the phishing message and ruined the network. That stupid user. Again, it's the stupid security people behind that user that allowed that to occur. So you've got to stop and think. In this whole kill chain of getting the attack to the user, the user acting, and then stopping it, because you know the user is going to click on a link. I don't care how smart the user is, you just have it statistically from the Verizon Data Breach Report, 4% of people will click on an attack, whether it's a phishing message or something else. You've got to expect that 4% to act, even if it's 0.4%. In an organization of 1,000 people, 0.4% is still 40 people? Yeah, 40 people. Anyway, sorry, I got to do math. But that's still a lot of people. So you've got to start considering that. That's like the kill chain. Now, backward mitigation. Like I mentioned before, if the user sees, for example, here's a phishing message and clicks on the report button and says, hey, I see this is a phishing message, I'm going to report it, the admins can then say, hey, wait a second, this is a phishing message. Let me try to delete this out of everybody's inboxes before they open it up. And let me actually send a warning out to people that says, hey, if you got a message from somebody, this is not a real message. Please delete it. If you opened it up and acted on it, please let us know so that we can prevent it. And you're not going to be punished for it. We just need to know. So yes, we know this attack is ongoing. Please let us know if you're experiencing this attack or don't open up the attack in progress. That can happen. Um, so anyway, let me give a case study. How many people heard about me in the Syrian Electronic Army? Okay, they really hate me. Uh, and I'm kind of proud of that. The FBI actually said that they hated me more than President Obama at the time, and I asked them to put that in a letter. Um, so anyway, let me tell, okay, so here's what happened. Um, I went ahead and, like, so companies called me in because of what I do. Like, you know, what happens is when you have an attack, like a phishing attack or something, a company, you call a company like, you know, the Mandians of the world or CrowdStrikes or whatever, you come in, you give them millions of dollars, they take care of the technical infection and tell you where you went wrong and something like that, and then they go away, and then the attackers come back the next week, they get in and do the same things again. Why do they get in and do the same things again? Because even though you clean the technology, you didn't stop how the attackers got in in the first place. And usually they got in because users did something unwise, and you let the users do something unwise. So I get called in after the fact to say, hey, 
Um, can you please help us stop this from keep happening to us? So anyway, I would go in and the Syrian Electronic Army, they were actually really pervasive and they're still kind of pervasive, but you don't hear about them as much anymore because they do less public things. But generally, I mean, they hacked the Wall Street Journal, they hacked a whole bunch of other people, they hacked the Associated Press Twitter feed and caused the stock market to sink by 500 points in 30 minutes because they tweeted out from the AP Twitter feed, they tweeted out that there was an attack on the White House and President Obama at the time might have been injured or something like that. So everybody thought that was really bad and the stock market took a dive. So anyway, I got called in and we would, you know, investigate and stop them and, like, patch things up. And then what happened was, at RSA, um, one year, when was it, 2014 or so? Yeah, 2014, I gave a presentation on the Syrian Electronic Army, I named a couple of them, and I called them a bunch of cockroaches. I called them the cockroaches of the internet, which they are. And so what happened was, you know, because they just keep trying, you know, it's, they're just annoying. They're not smart, they just keep trying. So anyway, what happened was, I went ahead and the Syrian Electronic Army one, apparently RSA recorded the session and then they finally put it up about three months later and then I'm sitting at home on a Friday evening and all of a sudden I get a, like a tweet, like a directed tweet saying, Ira Winkler, click, go to this link. I'm like, I'm not going to the link. You know, what do they think, I'm stupid? So anyway, then I get a friend call me up. They're like, Ira, did you go to the RSA home page, you know, conference page? I'm like, no. They're like, well, go there. So I went there and I'm like, what? It looks normal. They're like, are you running um, JavaScript? I'm like, of course not. They're like, turn on JavaScript. So anyway, I go, I'm not turning on JavaScript. So anyway, I turn on JavaScript, and then it's like, Ira Winkler, you're a cockroach. I'm like, what do I care what they think of me? So anyway, then what happened was I call, you know, I call up a me who was CEO of RSA at the time. I'm like, what? I go, your website's calling me a cockroach. What the hell? And he's like, anyway, so then he's like, we're looking into it. So I started looking into the whole thing. And then what happened was it turned out that what the Syrian Electronic Army did was they looked at the RSA conference homepage and they figured out that when you go to the RSA conference homepage, the first thing it does is it loads up a JavaScript program called Lucky Orange. And what this Lucky Orange program does is track your cursor movement across the screen that RSA uses for analytics. So yes, the RSA conference website is tracking you, by the way. So anyway, that aside, and what they figured out was that this RS, the link to start it up came from um, w1.livestatserver.com slash javascript program. So what they did was they figured out livestatserver.com that this company Codero was the actual DNS holder for it. But so what, what happened was they figured out that the domain was locked but not this w1.livestatserver.com. So the w1 subdomain was not locked. So then what they did was they sent spear phishing messages to this Codero company saying, oh, it looked like it's from the CEO saying, oh, our company was featured in the Wall Street Journal. And they sent out these spear phishing messages to people from LinkedIn to the company. And then a couple of their account executives opened it up and gave their credentials like, you know, oh, before you read the article, you have to enter your user ID and password, which they did. And then the Syrian Electronic Army people logged in as those people, and then they used one of their accesses to restat, reset the w1.livestatserver.com to an injure.com file. So literally, they didn't hack the RSA website itself, they just redirected the domain that it called when it started up, and which just sent people to a picture. So anyway, I wrote an article on my website on why the Syrian Electronic Army was still a bunch of lame cockroaches, so then what happened was, um, a day later, they ended up hacking the Wall Street Journal Twitter feeds. And the Wall Street Journal Twitter feed, yeah, well, that's the BuzzFeed. So anyway, they hacked the Wall Street Journal Twitter feed, declaring me the cockroach of the internet. And I was like, really? So anyway, the thing that bothered me most was a reporter from the Wall Street Journal retweeted it out. I'm like, you idiot. So anyway, then what happened was I called up the Wall Street Journal, which is run by CBS, anyway, and I started getting like you know information from there. And then what happened was when the Wall Street Journal was hacked, oh sorry, when CNN was hacked, the Wall Street Journal covered it. And now that the Wall Street Journal was hacked, CNN wanted to cover it, so CNN interviewed me. And again, I called them a bunch of cockroaches. 
but I was also called the go-to guy for the internet. And people were coming to me, it's like, Ira, are you the Syrian Electronic Army? Because you're getting a lot of publicity out of it. I go, no, I, I couldn't have planned this any better, honestly. And what happened was then, like, so CNN ran a story, and then two days later, the Syrian Electronic Army hacked the BuzzFeed Twitter feeds to call me a cockroach. And I was kind of like, this is really getting old. And then apparently the Syrian intelligence services, which would give them money, said, what are you wasting all this time for on this thing? And then like, then, so like two hours later, they hacked out, oh, BuzzFeed, by the way, stop talking about Syria. And I'm like, that's what they think. So then what happened was I called Brian Krebs. I'm like, I know Brian. And then I'm like, and Brian's like, they're doing all this just to call you names? I'm like, yeah. He's like, that's even too lame for me to cover at this point. So then I started, I wrote another article um, that I was going to publish in Computer World, pretty much covering the whole thing because there's a whole bunch of stuff which is really not technical that they were doing and still having tremendous success. So I was like going to write a, you know, so I wrote an article for Computer World, and I was, you know, and then like we're talking, it's like, you know what, they're going to try to hack Computer World really, really quickly. So before we went ahead and wrote, released the article on Computer World, what we did was we gave people in Computer World a mini awareness lesson, very specifically targeting how this was going to happen. I go, for the most part, we can pretty much assume that they will send a message that looks like it's from an executive of Computer World or the IDG, the parent company of Computer World, and they will send you to a link like of a magazine or something about the thing, and then they will go ahead and ask you for your credentials. Do not give this once you get it. Report the message and send it to the admins and then simultaneously delete it and so on. So anyway, we did that. The article went live. Um, within four hours of the article going live, they started receiving these phishing messages. And the funny part was, they, these guys are so lame. So I'm trying not to curse, but anyway, these guys are so lame. What happened was, they sent out a message from an executive who left the company two months earlier and just never changed his LinkedIn profile. So everybody knew from the start that, how, that it was going to be a fake message. But then they start saying it's like, and then people would, like a few people did click and they entered credentials like, uh, you know, Assad at, you know, ahole.com, you know, and then for like a password, it's bite me and stuff like that. But anyway, they literally got, had no success doing it. And why was that? Because we knew exactly how the attacks were going to come. We knew exactly what they would look like so we could warn people proactively. We knew exactly what would happen. We knew what would happen if somebody received the message and clicked on it. And then we had people trained on what to do and how to properly respond. So that's using the kill chain. But the critical thing is the missing piece for a lot of this is process. Nobody has established for a lot of these things a coordinated process for overseeing a combination of technology, governance, and awareness, and combining that as a whole. And that's the biggest problem when we're talking about human-based attacks as a whole. So anyway, start doing this. Nobody's defining the process to the user and letting the users know what that process is. So this is the concept I'm trying to get at with a human security officer. We don't have anybody out there who is specifically looking at a coordinated response to user error, despite the fact that user error, in one way or another, is, the, is causing 90% of the major incidents that are out there. And that's not even making it up. This is every study out there is showing that the human is the primary attack vector in significant attacks. And nobody is out there saying it. They have little piecemeal efforts. Oh, we have this, we'll, we'll put in some technology to stop phishing as an example. You know, we'll have somebody send out funny videos. And again, we'll put up policies and procedures on the shelf. Nobody actually defines what a person's job is. Nobody actually defines what an email, you know, how to review emails as an example. They just say, oh, watch this video. Does the video have anything to do with your own, own internal governance? Usually not. I mean, because think about it this way, you are letting, you are letting like this third party video trying to set your security policies for how your users are to react. So for example, if you have a video that says, oh, a good password, it has eight characters, has numbers, letters, and special characters, and that's how you should design your password, that's the standard off-the-shelf video. How many of you actually have that policy? 
We worked with a company putting together, the, putting together their awareness materials, and they had a 10-character password. And we're like, we can't let you use any off-the-shelf videos because nobody has an off-the-shelf video with a 10-character password. So we had to put special videos together and so on, and specific targeted guidance and everything. So anyway, somebody has to look at, if we know the user is going to be the target of an attack, what are the likely attacks, and go through the kill chain to figure out at every phase, how can I prevent the attack from getting to the user? How do I get the user to do the right thing? And then simultaneously, how do I mitigate the damage? And again, from yesterday, also, how do you mitigate the damage if the user's just being malicious? Because then the user, you don't have to worry about how the attack got to them. You have to worry about what processes and abilities did you give the user? And then how can you detect when the user starts to do something wrong? Accounting does that really, really well. But we don't learn from other disciplines because we're just smarter than all those people, right? So anyway, that's part of the whole thing. So what does a human security officer do? And I pretty much spoke to much, most of the slide. You know, it's a coordinated response after you look at a kill chain. What are the, you know, and you should start up first. What is the governance that needs to be put in place? If a user is, for example, is supposed to take data and PII and distribute that PII, what is the process for that? from step by step by step. Then you figure out how does technology fit into that? Can you use technology to take away potential damage the user can do, as an example? Then what technology can stop the damage from occurring after that? Those are all critical concerns. And then you have awareness, and, and this is the big thing. Awareness, like I said yesterday, should not be how to scare people away from the wascally wabbit. Awareness should be, how do you get people to do the right things? What are the right things? Too many awareness programs are featured on scaring people about, you know, the, the bad, evil hacker. As opposed to saying, here's the proper way to do your job, and if you do your job in the right way, you won't cause damage, or you will do it in a way that will not result in forwarding the hacker attack, and so on. Anyway, so W2 fraud, I gave this example yesterday, so let me talk instead about, um, so let's, yeah, I'll give W2 fraud again just because I'm getting tired. So anyway, W2 fraud, like I mentioned, somebody like around tax season, somebody's going to send out a W2 fraud message and they're going to send it to somebody in HR and the W2 message and the message is going to say I'm the CEO I'm traveling we just have a new accounting firm the accounting firm has to send out W2s to our employees please send out this information it's got to go out today I'm in a hurry whatever the case may be so anyway they send out and, and then the, the user is sitting there like oh this is from the CEO I got to do it what the user should actually do, and somebody should, a human security officer or somebody should go through the process of saying, hey, the user looks at the message. In the first place, the message should be filtered out, or if it's not filtered out, it should say, this comes from an external source, so clearly it's not coming from the CEO. And if it even if it comes from the CEO, the user should say, the process, W2, W2s contain PII. My process for PII is I don't send out PII. I give any request for PII to my manager, who gives it to the head of human resources, and then if it's to go out, they need the support of the general counsel. So that message should be shot up to the top, and the user says, hey, I don't care if it's the CEO sending this, I'm not allowed to do this. And then, even if that fails and the user finds the information and sends it out, you should have data leak prevention software on your endpoints filtering out any sort of W2-related information, any sort of PII going to external sources, so that should theoretically take care of it. So again, at the end of the day, which ones are you creating with your awareness programs? How are you dealing with stuff? And I use the example of Marines, because I was in the Marine, and there's a whole thing of anybody, I think I asked this last year, did anybody know a general, anybody here in the military at one point in time or another? Okay, you people know, any general orders of the century, anybody hear of that? Every organization has general orders of the century. Why? Because they expect the centuries, in other words, people, everybody does guard duties. Usually it's low level nobodies do guard duties. And what happens is they expect absolutely no brains whatsoever from these people. And what they do in that case is they have general orders of the century. And general order one, for example, in the Marines was do not quit your post until properly relieved. Why do they have to give a general order that says don't leave your post until you're properly relieved? 
Because do they think somebody might just walk off? Yes. Do they also think, and this is actually more important, do they think that, for example, let's say I'm on my post, and my post next to me is being attacked. The natural reaction is, I should grab my rifle and go help defend that post, right? It's like, no, they don't want that person to actually think, hey, wait a second, I'm going to support them, because this person might not realize that that's a diversion to get through your post. So they say, general, you do not leave in any way, shape, or form. And then they also say, you're in command. So if a general drives up and says, hey, I'm a general, I want to go through, you're like, I'm in charge here. You're not on my list. It's like, oh, well, I don't care. It's like, okay, well, that, now I have to go to General Order 9. General Order 9 is for any situation not covered by instruction. Call the corporal and the guard. Why is that important? Because I'm an idiot. I don't know any better. They want me to call somebody else for help. So I'm going to let somebody else make the decision who has more time and more authority than me. And so that's the thing. I'm not saying treat your people like idiots, but treat people in the proper way to do their job. Not what to be afraid of, not is this the wascally wabbit at any point in time. You want your people, here's what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to behave, not what am I supposed to be afraid of. Because if you keep training them, hackers are going to do this. It's going to be, well, is that the wascally wabbit or is that somebody? It's like, well, no, I've never, nobody ever took, they said that hacker might try to be an executive wanting W 2 information, but this person just wants healthcare information, so that's okay. Nobody ever warned me about that. You don't want people to make that decision. You want people PII, here's how I release it as an example. So anyway, in summary, acknowledge user failing is not a user failing. It's a your failing. It's your organization's failing, and that's fundamental. There needs to be coordination in mitigating attack and losses with people. In other words, technology, governance, and awareness have to be combined in a way that people are organized. And you know, organizations have things like chief network architects that oversee, make sure all technology works together and stuff like that. Why isn't there, given the user is the real, you know, the bane of everybody's existence these days, why is nobody overseeing the user in a coordinated way? Because it's so much more than awareness. Anyway, this is the image I left other people with yesterday, but remember, your users are just, when a user makes a mistake, they're the canary in the coal mine for your organization. That if a user makes a mistake, there's a problem with your entire system. And making the user more aware is just like giving the canary in a coal mine a gas mask. You've got to go ahead and make sure that you provide, if that user makes a mistake, it's not the stupid user, it's where did the problem occur in my system that allowed that user to be stupid and for us to get damaged. Anyway, buy my book, my book is awesome. Um, by my next book, it's not out, so crappy example, that's me, Nitron, go do their demo or whatever so I can be happy, and life is over. Anyway, any questions? I think, am I on time? No, I'm not. Anyway. Is this working? Oh, it is. Yeah. Announcement. Um, great job, Ira. Let's thank Ira.